Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real time global insights. Well, where I live here in East Central Illinois, it was the first time this morning that it had been raining in a long time. And so it got me thinking about looking back over this past summer and what our precipitation looked like. So I'm going to show you a series of maps to get us started today. This is June 1st to July 1st. And you're looking at total precipitation ranks by climate district. And so you can see here the numbers range again from 1 to 128, which represent our 128 year record. Something of note to take down here, you notice how wet it was parts of the Pacific Northwest. This, this early summer precipitation there is actually one of the reasons why there was so much fuel for some of the fires that we did see here over the last month and a half in parts of the Pacific Northwest. But across parts of the rest of the United States, there were some just patchy regions of drought that were developing. As we then got into the month of, of July, take a look at the changes we saw here. Parts of the Southwest went very, very dry, but some heavier rains in parts of the Central Plains getting into Missouri, over into Illinois, while parts of Iowa and the Eastern Kumut were drying out and parts of the East Coast were drying out as well. But then as we flipped from uh, July into the month of August, this is where things really began to shift. We saw our drought region expand here in parts of Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, and northern Illinois. We then saw tropical systems coming up through parts of the east coast here, really increasing the rainfall in parts of the Carolinas, getting up the mid-Atlantic, including states like Virginia, and then also with stalled boundaries that really hammered this section of the country as well. And as we look at what happened out west, the extremely dry conditions out west, which of course have led to so much uh, forest fire here with the way the pattern stagnated at times are seen quite well in, in this particular map. But over the last uh, month here, so this is September 1st through the 28th, we can now see who's been getting the rain and who hasn't. We know that uh, the rainfall that's been across parts of the south, so this is from Sally, this is from Beta, eventually Beta making its way all the way over to the Mid-Atlantic. But notice just to the north of it, there's a stripe in through here of very, very dry conditions that stretch from parts of Missouri through southern Illinois into Indiana and all the way up to the northeast. We've been drier in parts of the north central plains, but there was some wetter conditions right in through here, primarily due to that cutoff low. Remember that snuck in here, brought snow to Colorado, the huge temperature swing back at the beginning of the month. But meanwhile, you've noticed a pretty constant theme, and that is that the western part of the United States has been very dry. So with that as our backdrop, I would like to show you a pretty cool map I made this morning. Now, this is going to look over the time period of March 1st to September 26th, and it's going to compare the number of days we had rain greater than a tenth of an inch. 2019 versus 2020. So everywhere that you see the blue shading, that was where, of course, 2019 had more precipitation events. And there are some places, some places, excuse me, in the midsection of the United States, stretching over to the Great Lakes and Northeast, where we had as many as 30 days of, of, of 30 more days, I should say, than in 2020 of rainfall better than a tenth of an inch. But look at the difference down here in parts of the southeast. That is where 2020 has been wetter compared to 2019, with some locations there having upwards of two additional weeks worth of rainfall events. So just an amazing way to kind of compare uh, two years here. Well, here's the precipitation I was talking about. This is a radar animation starting midday yesterday on Sunday, going through the early morning hours here. And there's kind of a unique meteorological event happening in the midsection of the country. And it's particularly interesting for us just to understand how the precipitation shield that moved across parts of Iowa and is now this morning stretching all the way from this section of Texas through Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, up into parts of Indiana and Michigan. And what we call this particular setup is an anafront. Now what I'm talking about there is if you take a look at the winds, these are the winds early this morning, we do have one frontal boundary that is sitting here, one frontal boundary that is sitting here. These are both cold fronts. But over the top of this, we actually have winds about a mile above our heads that are kind of running over both fronts in this direction. So the main precipitation event is actually happening behind uh, the lead front, which is this one right in through here. Let me show what I mean. If we just kind of zoom in on the midsection of the United States, what you you're going to see here as I kind of take you forward is I'm going to pause it right about there and then let this kind of work through the overnight hours. You see the main frontal lead frontal boundary is actually way out here. Okay, we can actually even see it on radar as I let it kind of cut through some of the uh, clear air uh, echoes right into there. So there's our main front, but the broad precipitation shield is behind it. So what you tend to get in this situation is a broad area of lighter rainfall instead of the more intense rainfall you can get. <clears throat> excuse me, you can sometimes get along a much more 
a sharp front where the air is forced to rise immediately over the top of it. We don't have that. This particular case is called an anafront. Now, since we're talking about wind directions, I would like to show you what was going on yesterday across the western United States. So as these fronts were cutting here into the central plains of the U.S., we did have flow that at times was coming out of the east toward the west and then cutting through the Central Valley of California. And this, of course, made our fire problems much worse across the western part of the United States because as the air descended the uh, mountains here and then went into the Central Valley, we do get some compressional warming. And then that was a very dry air that was then blowing across parts of California here, making the fires uh, much worse yesterday as the air was again going offshore. As we let this plane to the overnight hours, you can actually see the fires here showing up on infrared satellite imagery. Uh, those would be the hot spots there that are seen in black. This was probably the one that got the most news attention yesterday, blowing right here uh, near uh, Santa Rosa. So this was uh, one of our larger fires we're still dealing with in this part of California. Okay, from there, what are we expecting to see for the rest of the day today? Well, by midday today, we can see the full extent of that frontal boundary uh, pushing here all the way into parts of the eastern Corn Belt, cutting down into parts of the south, all the way into Mexico. And so we're going to have some stronger winds in the central part of the United States today while things calm down in the west, uh, and with that, a pretty major change in the temperatures. Now, before I get to those temperatures, I would like to show you what to expect in terms of precipitation today. Storm Prediction Center is going to be watching parts of Mississippi, Alabama coming into parts of, of Tennessee, Kentucky into Ohio today for some stronger storms. And that'll then move tomorrow here over toward the Carolinas before this low cuts off uh, the East Coast. But let's just get you right up to early this morning. This will be 8 a.m. You're going to see a broad shield of precipitation along that Anna front. See him through here, stretching in parts of Indian Ohio up into Michigan. But then we notice that right along the front as it goes through parts of T uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, down here into parts of the south, we are going to have more normal frontal band of precipitation precipitation, as you see right in through here, working away to 9 p.m. this evening. On the back side of this, you notice that we will be expecting this afternoon for some scattered showers in the colder air on the back side of this. So don't be surprised in parts of Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Missouri, that area to see some scattered showers on the back side. Working away early into tomorrow morning, we do have a secondary wave that's cutting out of parts of Saskatchewan and Manitoba, cutting into uh, the Dakotas here in Minnesota, bringing another chance for some precipitation. But it will then pull into the deeper low that's cutting through parts of Ontario and heading on over toward Quebec. As we get through the day on Tuesday, this is Tuesday afternoon and evening. We can see the NAM model picking up very well on the leading edge of that frontal boundary, producing quite a bit of precipitation from Florida clear up to the northeast. And this will be bringing some much needed rain into the northeast as I work all the way out to early on Wednesday morning. So slow moving, deep low cutting through Ontario and Quebec and the lead wave, excuse me, the leading front out ahead of it here, uh, bringing quite a bit of precipitation to the East Coast. So we're watching that through the next three days. Putting that all together, this is from the European model. And what I want to point out here is that it, when you're behind where that frontal boundary kind of stalls out, we will see generally lighter rainfall amounts. Uh, you know, uh, let's call it a half inch to three quarters of an inch of rainfall. Some heavier amounts in parts of Ontario getting around Lake uh, Huron and through this area. But as that frontal boundary slowly starts to pull across the East Coast, we could get some locally heavier amounts in this region. I have good models support from uh, both the Euro and the GFS. Now, after that, what about the four days that follow that? So this would be uh, day four through day seven, getting us all the way out to next Sunday night and early Monday morning. We do have another low that will be cutting in through this area, bringing some precipitation at the end of the week and weekend. But again, amounts are generally light as it cuts through this particular area and very dry uh, outside of that. So I'd like to show you what that all looks like and take a look at this upper level pattern so as we can stretch this out in the next couple of weeks. So as we look here, uh, we're focusing in on the North Pole, and there's a couple of areas I want you to watch. First of all, we will be seeing highly amplified flow. We talked about this last week. Trough here south of the Aleutian Islands, large ridge built up the East Coast and that, uh, excuse me, West Coast, and that, of course, brings in the warmth. And across the East, we're going to be dealing with this trough. Downstream of all of this, things stay very bunched up over Europe. We're going to see this high over low setup across Europe, and I'll show you the implications of that in a few moments. But as we play this forward, I just took you all the way out to Thursday afternoon here, October 1st, and we just see the pattern really staying much in the same way that it stayed at the beginning of the week. Deep trough, 
large rage across the west, another deep trough over the Great Lakes, and things bunched up here over Europe. We really see this pattern uh, getting stagnant for a little while. As we then play through the end of the week, getting into the weekend, we will see another shot coming around the backside of this trough, uh, possibly giving us another low that cuts here through the Great Lakes states, the northern plains, and eventually over to the east coast here. But again, it's, it's the same thing throughout much of this week, so a cooler pattern really evolving here. But notice by the time I get you out to next Monday, look at this high over low setup here for just this big ridge north of Scandinavia and the troughs that keep cutting in basically from the UK into France, Germany, all the way here, even into parts of eastern, excuse me, western Ukraine. But as we play this forward, we notice that as the atmosphere goes into kind of this reset mode after the first week of October, we're going to let the pattern relax across the U.S., so a warm-up, as we build in our next trough here that comes out of the Bering Sea and then eventually cuts back into uh, you know, the Gulf of Alaska here. So the question will be, will this get us set back up with another highly amplified pattern, bringing another trough of cooler air into the east? Or will things stay a bit more relaxed as we see here, stretching this all the way out to the 11th of October? To show you all of that kind of at least plan out through the next seven or eight days, let's play out our European model. And we've seen it already to this point. So let's get through Wednesday where we've already seen the NAM model pull through. Throughout this week, northerly flow across this section of the country, keeping things cooler. So we definitely know we have some cooler weather here. Scattered showers in parts of Manitoba, Ontario, and into the Great Lakes states. As we then work our way into Thursday evening, now working away into early Friday morning, we're going to watch our next shot at getting some precipitation by Friday evening coming out of Saskatchewan, Manitoba. And then as you see here, this low coming through the midsection of the country here, this will be through the day on Saturday coming into Sunday morning. And there is good multi-model support. This is also here in the GFS at this point as well and looks as though it might bring in some scattered light rain for next week and into early next week. But once again, pulls into the northeast really bringing in some wetter weather here after a very dry September up to this point. High pressure builds behind it. Another shot, reinforcing shot at some cooler air. But it's after this that that pattern relaxes. We're going to watch pretty carefully. Okay. So week two, GFS ensemble over here on the left, European on the right. We've seen both models really struggle to return quite a bit of moisture into much of the United States. So we still see that even though these fronts come passing through, drier conditions compared to normal. And that's actually been a pretty consistent theme uh, for the end of September, and beginning of October, which we've been talking about for a while. We do need to watch what's coming here out of the Gulf of Mexico uh, for potential tropical cyclone development. But before I show you that, I would like to say that high or low pattern that's going to be occupying much of Europe will be bringing in a lot of heavy precipitation, France, Germany, uh, uh, you know, even getting right here into the heart of Europe. But notice this is Ukraine, wetter in the western side of Ukraine still dry. So let's continue that narrative from last week across much of the Russian wheat belt when we look at over the next 15 days. Okay, anything going on in the tropics? Well, we're going to keep an eye right here, 20% probability from the National Hurricane Center of something developing. But you notice that much of the rest of the open Atlantic is still kind of quieting down. If we kind of take a look why, I'm going to show you what's going on with wind shear first. This was the major drop in wind shear across the Atlantic we saw throughout the month of September, letting, uh, allowing for a very active time period. These wind shear values are bumping up here as we go back into uh, the end of September, beginning of October. And you can see it very very well here on October the 3rd. This map just shows you wind shear. The brighter the color here, the more red the color, the higher the values. So with those deep troughs coming in like this, it's going to be very hard to get something toward the east coast or coming out of the Gulf of Mexico because of these high wind shear values as we finish September, begin October. But here in the Caribbean, we could be on the lookout for watching something develop. So I'll just give you a quick tropical update there. Let's talk about temperatures as we move toward the end of this video. September 1st through the 28th, very warm in the western United States. Across much of the rest of the country, even though we had a couple of time periods of warmer temperatures, it'll probably go down uh, as a cooler than average month, especially as you get down here into parts of the southern plains. So what are we looking at in terms of temperatures? Well, as those fronts come through here this week, early this week, today on Monday, temperature change compared to Sunday is going to be quite dramatic in some places where we could be up to 20 degrees cooler than we were just yesterday. But let's watch those temperatures, high temperatures first throughout this week. So Monday's highs, very cool in the midsection of the country while the west and the east hang on to their warmer bias. But as you'll see here, as we get into the day on Tuesday, that much cooler air then sinks right here into this section of the U.S. while the west warms back up once again. 
So here's Tuesday's high temperatures. Wednesday's a bit of a reprieve here, but the next shot of cooler air comes in Thursday. And we see from Thursday into Friday, our next weekend in this section of the country is going to be quite cool. While the Western United States has a lot of 90s in the Central Valley, 80s getting up here into the Columbia Basin, for example. But as we work our way into uh, Saturday, again, a lot of high temperatures here in the 50s and 60s in this section of the country. So certainly a taste to fall as we work our way into next weekend. Now, what about those overnight low temperatures? So we're going to start tomorrow morning. We're going to be watching for some patchy frost in this section here of Nebraska, but very warm compared to normal up the East Coast. And as we go from there forward, this is what Wednesday's morning lows look like compared to normal. Watch for Thursday, though, patchy frost coming into this area here of the high plains. As we go from Thursday into Friday, I'm going to be concerned about the potential for frost across much of Nebraska. This section of Iowa, certainly the Dakotas, Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, getting into the 30s in parts of Illinois, Indiana, Michigan here. As we go from Friday into Saturday morning, again, our frost region we're going to keep an eye out on is going to be right here. Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, parts of northern Iowa as well. And then as we go from Saturday into Sunday, again, that cooler air is going to start to move off to the east as the pattern begins to relax. As we look out here in the 6 to 10 day time period, we can still see that highly amplified pattern we talked about last week, keeping the west warm uh, in the east on the cooler side of things. But again, it looks as though the pattern might relax as we go out here pretty longer term, looking at the, um, uh, you know, the second week of, of the month of October. The European being a bit more generous with that warmer air across a broader section of the United States, something I think we thought we would see more of in the month of October. From there, I just want to finish up with a bit of a discussion about some things going on in the tropics. The MGO seems to have stalled out over here in phase uh, four or five. So that's going to keep a lot of our convection in this area and suppress some vertical motion here and also over this part of South America. And that's going to be critical uh, there over South America as we look forward in their forecast. Because a lot of this seems to be teamed up with what's going on with La Nina. We're expecting another drop in angular momentum across the planet. I think that's going to be due to another good push here of stronger trade winds. Our ocean temperatures in the central Pacific right now are down there around that minus one degree Celsius number. And as you can see, as we look back uh, here over the last uh, six weeks or so, there's certainly plenty of cooler water ready to surface in that area. So this La Nina is going to continue. Um, and it's a part of the reason why the MGO was stalling out. But what I wanted to bring up here at the very end is the implications this is going to have uh, on, on South America. We have seen multiple times where the model of a, a kind of overpromised precipitation a bit. And we still see that through the next 10 days, this region staying on the drier side of things. So we would call this a bit of a delay in the return of the monsoon uh, here in parts of South America. And, and really what it means is no early, really aggressive planting of the soybean crop. If we're still talking like this on October the 15th, maybe October 15th to the end of October, uh, this is going to start to show up as a major problem for the South American crop. And I'll keep you posted, all right? Have a good rest of your week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.